Baldwin plays a rookie fireman trying to prove himself, and Kurt Russell is his older brother in Backdraft, one of the new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune, and our first film is Backdraft, which wants to be the ultimate film about firefighters, but I think it does a better job, actually, of being the ultimate film about fire, because the fire scenes in this movie are truly extraordinary. If you want to fantasize about fighting a fire, this is it. And here is the opening fire scene in the movie as veteran Chicago fireman Kurt Russell and Scott Glenn are joined by trainee William Baldwin. Hey! Sorry, kid! I thought you were dead! All right! Yeah. All right. Yeah. We got him! We got him! Let's go! Right. Oh. Oh. Stand down. Also starring in Backdraft, Robert De Niro as the arson investigator trying to find out who's been setting all of these mysterious fires that feature a killer backdraft of smoke and flames. In a word, Brian, what is this job all about? Fire. It's a living thing, Brian. It breathes, it eats, and it hates. The only way to beat it is to think like it. The two best performances in the film belong to these two actors. Kurt Russell, a vastly underrated actor, here playing a fireman who is a hero at work, but unable to relate to his estranged wife, played with strength and vulnerability by Rebecca De Mornay from Risky Business. I mean, you're the best. You really are. <laughs> that you take, Jessica. You scare me now. Also featured in the film is the firehouse humor of Scott Glenn, here toasting the new trainees, played by William Baldwin and Jason Gedrick. Despite the fact that he was born with a rather dull expression and a really hideous pair of ears, <laughs> he not only took on a beast, but pulled from its clutches, assisted by a more famous and brilliant firefighter, me. A kicking and screaming civilian who will probably wind up suing us for breaking our fingernails. As a physical production, Backdraft couldn't be more compelling. The city of Chicago looks great. The fire scenes are completely credible with more smoke than we usually get in the movies. I mean, this isn't anything like the towering inferno. If there is a problem in the picture, I think it's in its thriller storyline of who is setting the fires. The corrupt politician character who figures in that story is hackneyed, as are other characters who get involved in the resolution of that plot. But that's a small complaint compared to the majesty of this film. I agree with you, Gene. I agree with you on both sides of your review. The fire scenes are great, and the scenes when they're not fighting a fire are pretty awful. What disappointed me, in a way, is that I was hoping that this movie would be about the everyday life and the lore and the craft and the experience and the camaraderie of firemen, and mm -hmm. it's not. It's an action picture, mm -hmm. and the action is spectacular. I don't know how they did it. It looks as yeah. if they had actors standing surrounded by fire. Yes. I'm sure that in real life, firemen cannot take chances like that, especially without wearing a mask. They run in there, they're enveloped in flames, they're racing around, they're saving people. It wasn't credible. But it was incredible. It was exciting. And that's why I recommend the picture, because of those action scenes, but, but not for the other stuff. Which surprised me, because uh, there are some good, as I said, good performances in there. I, I want to talk about Kurt Russell. I think that his character, I don't like what they, how they run him through this story, yeah. but his character is very solid. I mean, it's, it's, you, I'm not seeing Kurt Russell there. I'm seeing a guy who's of the streets, a worker, family tradition in, the, mm -hmm. in firefighting and has a problem. He loves firefighting and he just can't handle the rest of his life. You know, De Niro 
doesn't have as big a role no. as I would have expected, and that's too bad. I bet part of it was left on the cutting room floor because I wanted more about, you know, they have a couple of scenes where he takes his knife and he's prying a piece of wood aside to, you know, when he's trying to figure out how right. a fire starts. I'd right. like to know how an investigator works. What is he doing? What is he looking for with that knife? And he's mm -hmm. going around like this and looking underneath things. But they just have him doing it as business rather than as explaining some of the craft. I wish it had had more of that in it. Okay. Still ahead, Madonna's daring documentary of life on stage and backstage. We'll review Madonna Truth or Dare. But next, truly, madly, deeply, another ghostly love story. You're probably a figment of my imagination. I really love you. I really, truly love you. I really, truly, madly love you. Two lovers play a word game, but what's different about that scene is that one of them is dead in a new movie called Truly, Madly, Deeply. Now, I'm one of the people who had reservations about Ghost, which went on to become an enormous hit last year, despite my reservations. <laughs> but now I've seen a Ghost movie for grown-ups, and it answers some of the questions I had about last year's hit film. Truly, Madly, Deeply stars Juliet Stevenson as a woman whose lover has passed away, and she misses him bitterly. I'm in the sitting room, and I think there's no point going to bed because he's not there. Or I'm in bed, and I think there's no point getting up. <laughs> That's real grief and anger. But then a miracle happens. Her lover returns from the dead, and he's played by Alan Rickman as a musician who somehow didn't die in quite the approved manner, and so he ends up lingering behind on Earth. But there are complications, and one of them is that once somebody is dead, you can't go on loving them forever, especially if they develop the bad habits of the dead, such as getting cold all the time. And then a new man comes into her life, and sooner or later, she's going to have to make a decision. Okay, okay, no, this is what we do. I tell you everything about my life between here and uh, that statue there. You see it? And then you tell me yours, okay? And we hop, of course. No lies from the speaker, no interruptions, no questions from the listener. And we're off. Mark Damien de Grunwald, 32 next birthday, born Budley Salterton. Uh, Capricorn, I don't believe in that, that's star signs, I mean. Uh, parents alive, retired, uh, father silent, practically completely silent, uh, 18 years older than my mother, who is not uh, completely silent. Um, my problem with Ghost and a lot of the other Beyond the Grave movies is that I'd like to think of the afterlife as such an awesome experience that if you made it that far, you wouldn't want to come moping back to Earth again to solve mysteries that you left behind. Truly, Madly Deeply seems to understand that problem and to resolve it by giving us an ending where everyone, the living and the dead, has to accept reality. It's a grown-up movie with good performances, especially by Alan Rickman, who was a lot different here than when he played the villain in Die Hard. I enjoyed it. I uh, like parts of it. I like the setup of, for sure, as you showed here, with the grief and the anger when someone leaves you. And I, that isn't shown often enough. Of course, Last Tango in Paris is the classic story of that. That's good. Then when he comes back and they're the joyful affair together, I thought it was more silly than I thought it was uh, credible. That one I didn't think they played out credibly. And then the new uh, lover, the new f friend, if you will, uh, he didn't do anything for me at all. I didn't think it was much I of a thought, choice. I thought the new lover was an interesting choice. He was an original guy. And another thing I liked about the movie is when Alan Rickman, the dead lovers, when his pals from the afterlife turn up, you know, and she says, I've got ghosts sitting in my living room watching videos, and they're arguing over whether they should watch uh, Five Easy Pieces or uh, some well, other. Uh, you know, in a cute. way, what does go on over there? There's just a touch of that. Those sad people in the window looking at them who have come from beyond the grave to kind of bring Alan Rickman back. That was intriguing. I just didn't think that there was a real choice there, and that's what I had a trouble with. Okay, next you've heard the hype, and now get the real deal on Madonna, Truth or Dare. Our review is next. I'm so desperate. For what, honey? For some fun. Come together in every nation. You probably know who that is, Madonna, from the new concert documentary, Madonna, Truth or Dare. And this is nothing less than one of the best, most entertaining films I've seen this year. Exciting on stage and backstage, with Madonna giving us a rare look into Dad, the private side of a pop musician's wait. life on the road. For example, we eavesdrop on her conversation with her father before her concert in Detroit. He actually wonders if she can get him tickets. You, you undressed in this performance? 
No. Oh, God. Of course they don't. Okay. Well, whatever you guys can get us tickets for. Dad, I can get you tickets any night you want to come. And here she is getting her throat examined by a doctor as last year's boyfriend, Warren Beatty, looks on amazed that she seems to be recording everything about her life on tour on film. Well, anyone that comes into this insane atmosphere, you realize they all feel it when they come into this atmosphere. When they come into your dressing room, when they come wherever you are, they feel crazy. Now, do they talk about it? No, they accept it. Well, why don't they talk about it? Because. Well, you want to think about that, don't you? No, I don't. Let's get back to my Do you want to talk at all off camera? You have nothing to do. <laughs> she doesn't want to live off camera. Why just that's talk? That's <laughs> There's nothing to say off camera. Why would you say something if it's off camera? What, what point is there of what the? existing? Don't worry, music fans. The concert, part of the Blonde Ambition Tour, has been photographed extraordinarily well. Here she sings Holiday. Holiday! In between concerts, she entertains celebrity guests, like comic actress Sandra Bernhardt. I mean, all I do is hang out with everybody in the show after a while. It gets boring. Who do you want to meet next? <sighs> Who do I want to meet next? Who would really blow you away? I think I met everybody. <laughs> And Sandra Bernhardt goes on to talk about her recent sexual adventures as Madonna pushes her friends and herself to be honest in front of the camera. Now, a lot of time is also spent on the lives and sexual preferences of her backup singers and dancers. And not too many stars would ever give backup players that much screen time. In a way, it's a generous film for that reason. And Madonna doesn't spare herself. She comes across as heroic in keeping the tour going, but also a little adolescent in her preoccupation with sex. But that's the way she is, and she's smart and brave, I think, in producing this terrific film. I agree with you. I think it's a terrific documentary. Mm -hmm. And what I found especially interesting was that Madonna, who had complete control over this film, apparently yeah. decided to let everything hang out, including right. personal moments that another artist might have sued if they tried <laughs> to put it into a documentary. She's very honest there. And so yeah. it's interesting what she wants us to see about herself, how she presents herself. And I noticed two things. First of all, it's very important for her to be seen as nurturing, Your mother. that she is kind of the parent figure yeah. of these people backstage, and she takes care of them and all of their problems. Then the other thing I noticed was the way people behaved toward her, including people in her entourage, was not so much that she was a star as that she was a boss. I mean, she's got power more than she has charisma in her backstage persona. She's like a business executive. She's like a political leader. Mm -hmm. You get the feeling that she's in charge. She makes the decision. She gives the orders. And that when show business is no longer an option for her, if she wants to retire, she could go right into being a business executive of some sort, perhaps in another branch of show business. That's the impression I got, which was kind of surprising. Well, it is amazing that someone is able to be at the center of this storm, this concert tour, and actually pull it off physically. It's physical work. It's draining, and we see all that. And then to open up your private life like this, mm -hmm. I, I, you know... People are always complaining, oh, why are the stars always so plastic and they're surrounded by publicists and the interviewers ask safe questions? Okay, I can't believe there's a controversy over this when somebody opens up. I mean, you can't have it both ways. This is great. This should be the standard. Yeah. I'd like to take, to take away the stardom quality and show that these people are pretty hard workers, have talent, and are smart. It's an interesting film. It is terrific. Apart from the fact that it also happens to be about Madonna. When we come back... I come... I ask you to marry me, Miss Amelia. That is Vanessa Redgrave facing a moment of truth in our next movie, which is based on a famous novel by Carson McCullers called The Ballad of the Sad Café. It tells the story of a proud, independent, individualistic Southern woman named Miss Amelia 
who rules the men in her hamlet because she's the local moonshiner, the local healer, and also the strongest person in town. Her life is unrewarding but uncomplicated until visitors start to arrive in the little town. One of them is her cousin Lyman, played by Cork Hubert. I'm hunting for Miss Amelia Evans. How come? Because uh, she is kin to me. Cousin Lyman almost seems to have arrived in order to stir up trouble between Miss Amelia and her next visitor, her estranged husband who's just gotten out of prison. He's played by Keith Carradine. Sooner or later, it had to come to this, a fist fight between two proud people who give no quarter. <laughs> the Ballad of the Sad Cafe is one of those southern gothic emotional extravaganzas that you really can't take very seriously because the characters are too grotesque to believe, but hidden inside the story is a fable about strong men and strong women. And Vanessa Redgrave is absolutely spellbinding as the strong woman. There were all sorts of ways she could have turned Miss Amelia into a caricature, but she plays the role with fierce honesty, and her performance is the best thing in a very odd movie. I really went both ways on this. Was it a recommendation? Was it not a recommendation? I think maybe because of Vanessa Redgrave, I would say. Well, I'm yes. going to go the same way, and I and I think that uh, I have I just have one problem, and that is uh, unless you take it, and I think that's the way this is meant to be, some sort of just a fairy tale, and that's the way it was written by Carson McCullers, that you can't explain the cousin, the little cousin's mm -hmm. actions. Because mm -hmm. he just comes in, and he's like a malevolent little person. He wants to stir things up. That's it. I mean, in other words, but he comes, his, it's not like it's a real character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is just introduced in this story so that you have a whole, you have uh, three characters all wanting to love someone and not and not getting the love back he wants to he really wants to love uh, her husband i mean that's who he's enamored of and uh, he's mistreated mm -hmm. she's mistreated uh by uh the, the uh, cousin and he is mistreated by her so it so there's spins a lot around. of mistreatment going on but she's very good isn't she she's good and uh keith Carradine's fine too when we come back a second look at a movie called the rage in harlem which looks a little different since the first time we saw it now here's something a little different. On a program we did a few weeks ago, Gene and I both voted thumbs down for a new movie called A Rage in Harlem, which starred Forrest Whitaker and Robin Givens in a comedy about crime. Here's a scene from that movie. He spills a drink on me, and now he won't even ask me for a dance. Boy ain't got no manners. Well, honey, you just gonna have to make it up to me on the dance floor, huh? We like that, but not a lot of the little stuff over in the corners of the movie. Well, it turned out we weren't the only ones who thought so. It turns out the film's director, Bill Duke, decided to cut 10 minutes from the film before it was released. But through a studio shipping error, Gina and I were sent the wrong earlier version of the film, the version with the 10 extra minutes. Well, I've now gone back to see the shorter version of the film. I gave it a second look, and you know what? Bill Duke's cuts made a big difference. Ten minutes does make a difference. I would now change my vote on a Rage in Harlem to thumbs up. What about you? I had the same reaction, and um, just so you understand, I moved my, in the newspaper, I originally would gave it two and a half stars. Now I'll move it up to three stars. So it's not like the picture completely turned around, mm -hmm. but I, I, I like it now because what I felt that at the beginning was here is a sweet, wonderful love story between mm -hmm. two good characters, Forrest Whitaker and Robin Givens in her debut. And it gets interrupted with a bunch of uh, standard shoot 'em up foul mouth stuff that I wasn't interested uh -huh. in. And now the balance is a little restored. It could be even better. I'd cut, if it were up to me, yeah. cut a little more. And if I could find the scenes, put more of those two I back think one in. of the problems is the movie is based upon a novel that is filled from wall to wall with all kinds yeah. of colorful, eccentric yeah. characters. That's good reading. But in a movie, you've got to get that through line from beginning to end. And yes. these cuts make a rage in Harlem better. It's funny, we're the only people apparently in the world who saw the longer version. So now we've, we're reviewing now essentially the version that has been playing in theaters right from day one. Okay, let's now take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. We both voted thumbs up on Backdraft, but more for the spectacular action scenes than for the contrived plot. A split decision on Truly, Madly, Deeply. Gene didn't like the male characters in the film. I enjoyed it as sort of a grown-up version of Ghost. Two thumbs up, though, for Madonna, Truth or Dare, a fascinating, honest backstage documentary. 
And two more thumbs up for Ballad of the Sad Cafe, especially for Vanessa Redgrave's performance. And now here's something that hasn't happened before on the show. On the basis of a re-edited version of A Rage in Harlem, Gene and I both changed our votes from thumbs down to thumbs up. Uh, the Madonna film is the one to see. It is really special. It is raunchy, R-rated, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, there's a little more honesty and some just good, really good entertainment value, too, on the concert stuff. And some good special effects in backdraft. Mm -hmm.